Tom would always do his own sound effects. So when it, whenever Venom would, would headbutt him, he, he'd, go, he'd literally go, ah, and he would, he would land in the seat and he would do the whole thing. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Andy Serkis and I am presenting to you Venom Let There Be Carnage Notes on a Scene. I rebuilt my life and now I just want to live it. Good night. And how did you build this new life? Excuse me? Well, who found the clue on the wall so you could be this big shiny hero? <laughs> who found the clue? We are going to get into actually one of my favourite scenes of the movie where Venom and Eddie, who have obviously been living inside and outside of each other's bodies but in the same apartment, finally come to blows. It's the odd couple exploding moment. There's no more any words for his victims or, you know, they're gone. Any clues of outstanding bodies we, we've lost forever. It's completely... I didn't mean to. You didn't mean to? I said I'm sorry. You didn't mean to, but you did it. Tom has played this character in, in the previous movie and he works in a really interesting way. We'd all talked about different um, methods of bringing this character to life for him on screen, but actually it's all in Tom's head. Before every single scene, Tom records Venom's dialogue and then he has that playing back in his ear, in a, in a tiny little earbud, and then he's able to basically improvise and talk over Venom. So he's creating a soundscape, a radio play, if you like, for the entire scene. I mean, you just decided... I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. That's it. You did it. You know, you didn't even think that we might get caught. We might get killed. No, you don't think about things like that, do you? You just think about chickens. And you think about you. And you think about what you want. And you think about you. There's a chicken in the background of the shot. Can you see it? It's just here. We had a couple of chickens that worked with us, and they were all very professional. They all turned up on time and, uh, you know, were very, very undemanding and didn't leave a mess anywhere. So they were the perfect chickens to work with. But keep an eye out for the chickens in this scene. They are fundamental players. Let me remind you of something, Eddie. You were a loser before I came along. You were nothing. I made you special. Oh, you made me special, huh? Well, let me tell you something, right? Before you came along, I had a life. I didn't have chickens, right? But I had dreams. Yeah, I had dreams, and I had a fiancé, and I had a really successful TV show. Ah, but you destroyed all of those things by yourself. Yeah. We wanted this whole first part of the sequence to, to play in a one in, in a one shot. I mean, we could have covered it in lots of different angles, but it felt like the momentum of this roiling kind of argument that was kind of bubbling up between them, you needed to get a sense of the whole. So we, we just let this whole thing play out in one and, and rehearsed a, a few times. And it was a real tour de force by Tom. You know what? I rebuilt my life and now I just want to live it. Good night. And how did you build this new life? Here we have the introduction of Wraith Venom in this movie. The biggest difficulties in, in kind of br bringing the Wraith out of Eddie and Carnage coming out of Cletus was the way it ma uh, works with the cloth. You know, how does the symbiote fluid come out of his body? Uh, so a lot of work was done on, on uh, you know, finding ways of making it believable that, that all this fluid sort of emanates from inside and, 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 and grows and sort of can shoot out. And so, in fact, that affects costume even, choices of costume colour. If, you, if you'd placed, say, a white bathrobe on, on Tom there, you, it would be really, really difficult to, uh, to, make, to make this kind of feel believable and real. I rebuilt my life and now I just want to live it. Good night. And how did you build this new life? Excuse me? Well, who found the clue on the wall so you could be this big shiny hero? One of our main ambitions for this whole film was to integrate uh, Venom and, indeed, Carnage, when he becomes a part of the story, um, into the world. The holy grail for this was to make these kind of seemingly quite cartoonish visual effects characters come to life and feel photoreal. In an attempt to make these characters more believable, what we wanted to do with the faces of both Venom and Carnage when you finally see them is, although we weren't using uh, facial capture, motion capture, what we wanted to do was to take performances um, given by Tom and just use references uh, so that there was more expression in the eyes. Now, it's very, these are very, very difficult characters to anthropomorphize, to actually make human because of the, the, you know, the, the size of the jaws up here. And, and also there's very little that you can get out of the, of the eyebrows or eye movements. What we, what we managed to do is to, to put in very subtle sort of shifts in, in, in imaginary eyebrows, if you like. And we've increased hugely the, um, the amount of lip molding around the teeth when, the, when, when Venom speaking and that was something that, that, I, that I observed from the last movie that, that they, they were very fixed those grins and so we spent quite a lot of time working around the idea of course they can't fully express the range of motion that a human face can but what can we do to give physical cues in the facial muscles that would make these a little bit more forgiving and more, more believable <laughs> who found the clue who Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's an example of what I was talking about earlier in terms of the jaw movement, going, yeah, 
you know, it's kind of like really exemplifying how how, how powerful and uh, the musculature in the in, in in the jaw. So if you notice with venom here, you know, the, this the, the, all of this movement is additional in it, it, the, the detail of the musculature and the movement and the flow of all the tendrils and the and the symbiotic fluid that's flowing throughout throughout all his face and everything. All of this lovely detail is again something that we we've sort of upgraded from the from the first movie to give it more uh, reality and more texture. No, 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 this is not about being a hero for me, man. This is about wanting to live in peace. Do, do you understand what I'm talking about? No, you don't, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Okay, this is about me wanting to live without you, whining in my ear all the time about eating bad guys or like nagging me about Anne or destroying my place or destroying my life. Do you know how lucky you are that I chose you? You chose me? In the first movie, Venom had, I think, about three or four lines of dialogue. He really had to act in this movie. He really is a big character. There's so many scenes which are, which are you know, duologues between the two of them. We really needed to, to invest him with, with a growing sense of humanity. For all intents and purposes, you know, he's settled in. He's not an alien. He's, he's you know, one of us, and he wants to be accepted. He also wants to be the lethal protector, and he, he thinks that Eddie is vastly underselling um, their potential by, by keeping him hidden. He wants to go out there and save people and, and, and kill bad guys and bite their heads off. If we don't believe that central relationship between Eddie and Venom or care, then there is no movie. That's crucial. That, that's sort of like base one of, this, of, of, of the whole task of this movie is to, is to make sure that these creatures feel truly organic and living and, and have, have an emotion. It can be achieved in, in, in different ways. You, you try and create as much physical reality as possible for a start. It can go through being described and just just speaking it out for the, for them. But I'm the only person that took you in when your friends kicked you off the planet Ming Mong because you are a reject. You are a pariah. Need to protection my ass. You couldn't protect anything. You are useless. You can get a job down here cleaning toilets. <laughs> This is one of the funniest moments of the film for me. Uh, but he, he, Tom would always do his own sound effects. So when it, whenever Venom would, would headbutt him, he, he'd go, he'd literally go, ah, and he would, he would land in the seat and he would do the whole thing. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me, please. Let me fix it. I'm ready to so can bring it again. Yeah. I love the fact that Venom apologises and then breaks his nose again. I think that's, that's, that's typical of their relationship. It reflects a very human trait, if you like. You know, that, that one minute you can be, you can be so forgiving and, and so sorry or, or apologetic and then, and then the desire to, to hurt that person again. Of course, Eddie can't ever really be hurt. He, he repairs himself and if you notice... Um, in between those shots very quickly, his nose, which is bent out of place, kind of comes back to life again and, and, and reforms and becomes perfect and the blood disappears in that split second and then, uh, and then it gets broken again immediately afterwards. I'm ready to... So I can break it again! <laughs> I mean, Eddie Brock is such a narcissist. And actually, what's great about Venom, and he, he's such a direct character and he has no filter, so he's able to, to pinpoint all the weaknesses in Eddie and tell him straight up. And, that, and you know, Eddie really is looking at a mirror of himself and, dis, you know, discovering what a narcissistic, self-obsessed human being, flawed human being he is, which is why, you know, their relationship is so perfect. They're stuck with each other, but they're also the perfect match for each other. Son of a bitch! This is the beginning of what ends up being a huge fight between them. When I came on board to direct the movie, one of the first things I thought was there's an enormous amount of humour to be had out of this entire scene and that it should escalate and become a real buddy-buddy kind of bromance breakup in a, on a massive scale. And it grew very organically. Um, all of the things in the apartment we wanted, you know, to, to use elements of the set that had been made. This is his um, chew, chew toy. So when Venom kind of gets hungry and he, you know, he wants to bite people's heads off, I wanted that to get ripped, pulled down and thrown Eddie and so we used elements of the set that were all around and, and as the scene progresses it's a combination of practical elements so lights get thrown out of the window all of Eddie's possessions clothes all, all manner of things so these were all on wires which literally flew out of the flew out of the window combined with the visual effects of tendrils then grabbing those things and pulling them through <laughs> Oh, 
So what we really wanted to achieve in the scene is a couple um, of, of lovers breaking up. It's reached that moment in time, and it's the classic scene that you get in many, many movies where everything gets thrown out of the window, and uh, th- this lover's tiff kind of escalates into this massive war, basically. And, of course, the sound plays a huge part of this as well. Let's, let's not forget sound, because that emphasises and articulates every moment, gives it comedy, gives it danger, gives it, you know, ah, you really feel the pain for the character. This shot, particularly... Uh, happened, I think we felt we needed just a split second like a few frames of seeing Tom fly through the air uh, or be, be, be dragged through just to, to make sure that people didn't think it was a stunt guy Get out! Take your stuff! Get out! This is my house! I love that Venom is telling Eddie to get out of his own apartment I just I know, that was a brilliant piece of Kelly Marcel writing or maybe it was even Tom improvising I can't remember, I have to ask him but, you know, I mean Tom is so inside the character that, that, that it wouldn't surprise me that he would, maybe that moment, in fact, was him sort of saying, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's him telling, it's, it's Venom telling Eddie to get out of his apartment. He, he was fantastic at kind of reworking this radio play that I was talking about earlier, getting the spacings between the, the sound operator who was then playing each individual line into his ear. It was a, it was a real dance between the two of them. <laughs> Keep it down up there! What was the, the, the most important thing about this uh, whole film was that level of humour, that surreal, slightly psychotic, very funny, but be- believable situations. I was lucky enough to be able to come in to, to take on this story after the, all of that heavy lifting work had been done on the setup of the characters. Now it's seeing that delicious kind of evolution of their relationship as a couple. They go through all of the ups and downs of the familiarity, the, the, the excitement of being with each other, the boredom of being with each other, the day-to-day nightmare of living with each other in a flat, and the sort of different agendas that they both have and all of that kind of very human behavior but reflected in these two very different you know one human being and this 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 symbiote who wants to bite people's heads off and we've talked about him before being like an out of control toddler that is exactly what it's like you know an eight foot toddler living in, in, in your living room 